So second, an another project we had in um, the GPP was to try to get an understanding of how people assign uh, knowledge was one of the main focus of, of the project. And we have a number of studies on that question and I will be presenting only one of them uh, today. And I have a, a, another, another one as a fourth kids talk a little bit later, if we've got enough time. All right, and the question uh, in the study I'm going to be uh, presenting is uh, as the following one. When one forms a true belief, the belief that's actually fitting the world around us, uh, uh, by luck, can, you, can, one be, can one be said to know that thing? Traditional question in, in philosophy. Philosophers have been very worried about this question. And a subsidiary question, which is slightly more interesting, is what kind of luck are compatible with holding holding a belief, right? Is there some specific types of luck that undermine the status of knowledge uh, of one's true beliefs? Uh, and in uh, philosophy, there's uh, uh, an old sort experiment that uh, is meant to address this question. It's called the Gethin case. Um, so that, uh, how do we know things? It's hard, there's a, philosopher pro there's a philosophical problem Ed Edmond Gethin proposed that goes something like this. And here's one version of the case, not the one we used, but it's going to help you. So uh, John goes to train station and he's supposed to take a train. He looks at the clock and the clock says 3 p.m. 3 p.m. So he forms a belief, it's actually 3 p.m. So he has a belief, it's a reasonable belief to have, isn't it? Because he sees it's, it's a clock says 3 p.m. And it is 3 p.m. So he has a true belief, it's a justified belief, a reasonable belief, but it turns out the clock is broken. So had he looked at the clock five minutes ago, the clock would still have said 3 p.m. Had he looked at the clock 10 minutes ago, the clock would still have said 3 p.m. So his belief is true, it's justified, but it's true really by luck, right? And most philosophers want to say, it. it's one of the many versions of the Getty cases, of the Getty case, and many philosophers want to say, well, no, look, in that case, the character in the story just doesn't know that it's 3 p.m., right? She, 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 she simply believes it. So that, that's the kind of cases we've been using. And in experimental philosophy, that case has been extremely important. Blame that man right here, uh, Steve Stitch, which about uh, more than 20 years ago published this paper at the, uh, at the beginning of experimental philosophy that argued that there might actually be differences in lay uh, speakers' reaction to Gekie cases uh, uh, between um, um, East Asia and uh, Americans and also between Indians and, and Americans. And that paper created a storm that uh, some people are still trying to, uh, to, take, to uh, dismiss, um, but it's an extremely influential paper. Now, we've also learned that these early findings might be false positive. Um, um, so we've also learned, and Steve was very much involved in the follow-up work, that some of these early results might actually be mistakes. Um, uh, what some projects that Steve and I and a bunch of other people in some, also some Templeton funded research of one of our previous projects, a community uh, project, we gave people some uh, Gettier cases and some control question when one has genuine knowledge, when one has a false, has a diff obviously false belief. And we give them a, a bunch of questions. And as you can see, we, in that sample, we, that study, we had four, language, four languages and four, four sites, USA, Brazil, India, and Japan. Uh, each of the two bars for each country are a different way of asking the question. I just mentioned that very quickly. The first bar is knows that she does not know. You ask, do, does the agent know that she does, does, he doesn't know? So the second bar is knows versus he thinks he knows or she thinks she knows, but she doesn't know. Uh, and as you can see, with the second question, we get pretty much the usual philosophical intuition uh, in that case. But there's still interesting variation, for example, among Bengali speaker. Uh, if you ask the first version of the question, people actually don't share the usual philosophical intuition. That's the word jana, I believe, in, in Bengali. And if you use that, if you contrast knowing versus not knowing, people are totally happy to assign knowledge in, 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 in the case. And we've done that in a bunch of other, other countries. As you can see, it's the same phenomenon. If you contrast knowledge versus thinking he knows, you get uh, the usual philosophical judgment. But if you tweak the question, if it's just knowing versus not knowing, you have actually much more variation. That's actually hard, hard to, to, to just make sense of. Uh, 
Okay, so that was a work we did a long time ago. In between, there's been actually a lot of work with uh, 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 English speaking populations. And I said that it's sort of a mistake to focus on the Getty case. In fact, there are Getty cases and Getty cases. And what really deep matters for them is the type of luck that's at stake. The question that some form of luck seems to be incompatible with having knowledge uh, of a given proposition, other types of luck seems to be totally compatible with having knowledge of a given proposition. Um, uh, Christina Starmans and Harry Friedman were the first one to make that point in a paper published in uh, Cognition uh, a few years ago. Um, and one of the things they do in that paper is distinguish two types of, of cases. Unfortunately, you can't really read that. It's with an authentic evidence case and the contrast between authentic evidence case with um, with put it be <laughs> sorry yeah. uh, inauthentic I guess uh, apparent. <laughs> apparent evidence evidence apparent evidence case so an authentic evidence case it's a little bit of a tricky distinction so bear bear with me an authentic apparent, apparent case is when you form the belief based on the true matter of fact so for example you um, 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 you the example they use someone puts his or her watch on the nightstand, forms the belief that she has a watch, that the wife is on the nightstand, goes to take a shower, uh, a robber comes, try to pick up the, uh, um, um, uh, picks up, steals the watch, puts another watch on the nightstand, a cheap, a cheap, a replica, a cheap knockoff, right? And then, and then leave. And the question is whether you know that there is a watch on the night on the nightstand. Now you know it by luck in some way, right? Because it's just by luck that somehow the robber put back a watch, right? But it's an authentic case because your original belief was based on on, the, on an experience of a watch. And um, an, an apparent evidence case, or whatever the right terminology is, apparent evidence case will be one where your 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 original belief is not based on a true matter of fact, it's based on sort of an illusion. Something that's misleading. Right. So, for example, um, uh, an, an example I could give you of making that up: uh, you buy uh, you buy uh, uh, a diamond. Turns out it's not a real diamond. And when you do that, you wear your fancy shirt that your grandfather gave you. Unbeknownst to you, there's a diamond sewn inside the shirt. Right. It's, it's really a, it's really a nice thing inside. So you don't really know, and you have to believe that. Oh, I've got a diamond on me because you, you think you bought a diamond. Now, your belief is true, you have diamond on me because there's one in the shirt. It's by luck. But it's not, you, you never form your original belief based with a perceptual contact with a diamond, right? You, you, actually, you never, were never in touch, so to speak, with a diamond. So it's called an apparent evidence case, right? I hope it's clear enough as a distinction. What, uh, uh, what uh, um, uh, 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 Stamant and Friedman showed is that perhaps surprisingly, people are sensitive to this subtle distinction. Uh, these are uh, uh, English speakers, uh, lay people, non philosophers. So they're totally willing to assign knowledge in the first kind of cases when it's an authentic evidence. Yeah, it's just like a case of knowledge. Even so, luck matters a whole lot there. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a total case of knowledge, not in the second, not in the second case. Uh, so it's that there's something really fishy there. Uh, uh, All right, uh, and that effect was uh, reproduced by the paper we took a cue from John John Turi with Pasquater and, and and Blau, and what you see here is that uh, we they looked at a bunch of, of various Getty cases, and we're going to be looking only at a few of them. That's a genuine case of knowledge. That's a case where. Uh, uh, there could have been something going wrong with your acquisition of knowledge. It's a threat to your knowledge, but it never materialized, right? Uh, and in that case, it just doesn't matter. People don't care for assigning knowledge. Uh, this one was a case of authentic evidence case, which I described to you earlier. As you can see in the results, there's a decrease in the ascription of knowledge, but still half of the participants are totally willing to treat that as a case of knowledge. And this one is a control case where someone has, has, has a, a false belief. It's a case of, a case of ignorance. OK, so what we wanted to do was to replicate that study. So we have this nice uh, structure, knowledge, a knowledge case, a case where there is a failed threat to knowledge, but the threat never materializes. So uh, never materializes. So uh, people have shared knowledge. 
one with an authentic evidence case, which I described to you earlier, and one with this, an ambivalent situation. So participants were randomly assigned to the four, four possible situations, knowledge, failed threats. So the agent has a justified true belief acquired by everyday means, by communication, but her belief could have been false. There was a threat she could have actually uh, uh, got, obtained a false belief. Replacement, which is an um, uh, authentic evidence case, and just a case of ignorance. Uh, um, because we're a little bit short of time, I will, I will not read uh, the vignettes, but I'm happy to come back to that a little bit uh, later. There's the four vignettes we use in, in the study. So it's part of a much larger study on knowledge description. So that's why we didn't uh, vary the uh, specific material stimuli for that study. And they had four DVs, a control question to make sure that we understood what it was um, about. Um, and then a question about reasonableness. Is it reasonable <laughs> to form the belief? Are you justified based on circumstances to form the belief? And then um, I'll, I'll focus only on the questions about knowledge description. Our participants were for the usual pool of uh, GPP uh, participants, um, uh, the usual sites, uh, and in some, uh, in some sites in several languages, for example, uh, in uh, Peru and Ecuador, and as well as uh, South Africa, we're still waiting for, for data from, from India. That's why it's not a final version of, of this uh, study. We'll have three languages in India in the coming weeks, hopefully sooner than later. And here are the first results. So what you see here are the results with reasonableness. Is it reasonable? in that case to form a belief. And uh, this, the main factor I want you to be, um, 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 so the case in blue, that's in the situation of knowledge. Of course, it's totally reasonable situation of knowledge to form your belief. In uh, the failed threat, you could have had a false belief, but it did not really materialize. People think it's totally reasonable to form a belief in all the, in all the cultures. Um, in the case of the replacement, that's an authentic evidence case I gave you, people think it's totally reasonable to form, to form the, a belief there. After all, you saw the watch, right? It's totally reasonable to believe there's a watch on your nightstand. Um, and again, you, as you can see people all over the places. What's interesting is uh, in the case of the false beliefs, the case of ignorance. And um, it's known uh, in the literature as a role, as, as a truth effect. So the idea is that in some places, people value truth with respect to how reasonable it is to form a belief. Right? If, it, if it's not true in the world, then it's totally unreasonable to form a belief about that, that thing. In other cultures, and uh, that's the case in the, in, at least that was the case in the USA in the original sample, but as you can see, not here. Uh, in other, and what we see here is there's a variation in the significance of truth for the reasonableness of forming a belief. If you're a philosopher, what do you think about that? Is whether you are internalist versus externalist about, about your just reasonableness. What matters to form a reasonable belief is that what's in, what is it, what's in your head? In which case, what's in the world doesn't really matter. Or is it what's in the world that matters for forming a belief? And as you can see here, there's tremendous variation with respect to this question. Some of the cultures are, are externalist with respect to the reasonableness of forming belief. Truth matters a whole lot. Other cultures, other cultures aren't. So that's the first, that's the first result. That was not the main focus of the, of the study, but that's, that's one of the things we, we observed. So the main focus of the study was the second one, was to replicate the Turi et al. Uh, paper. And uh, remember, the basic finding of the Turi et al. paper is that there's a hierarchy. Knowledge and false belief and uh, false threats are treated similarly. Then there's a substantial decrease, but not a complete decrease for a Getty case that involves authentic evidence. You form your belief on the basis of the fact of the matter, but somehow by luck, your beliefs remain true, despite the disruption, right? Uh, and so they find in their studies that there's a decrease, but not a full elimination of the ascription of knowledge. And then you've got ignorance where people don't assign it. Um, um, uh, knowledge. As you can see, if you look at the uh, yellow bar, in our study, except among CPD in South Africa, when people, which was a question about this data set, I'm not sure what to do with it. In the case of ignorance, people don't assign knowledge. That's kind of a control question. That's what we want. To, that's the results we want. So I don't know what to do with this data set. Um, the key point I want to attract your attention here is that uh, in none of the samples we have, do you find uh, not even Maybe in the USA, but that's a weaker effect than to it at all. In none of the samples we observe do we find the, the, the results that Turi and colleagues reported. Uh, in all of the samples, basically uh, failed threats, forming a belief, you could have had a false belief, something was threatening you to have a false belief, 
and also forming a belief based on authentic evidence, but by large, it remains true. All of them are, are in many of the samples, they're all treated, they're all treated in, uh, uh, along this, treated similarly. There isn't, there isn't a lot of difference. In some places, like in Korea, there's a small amount of differences, but not, not, a, whole lot, not a whole lot of differences. So what we find here is that contrary to what uh, we were uh, expecting based on the work of Turi and, and Ad, there's in fact very little differences in knowledge description across these three types of situation, meaning these three forms of flood here, you know, there was a threat and by large the threat is, did not disrupt the formation of a true belief. And uh, by luck, the, the true belief that you had at the beginning remained true. Uh, uh, all these um, types of luck don't seem nearly to matter uh, to the extent that we, we used to believe earlier, and to the extent that many philosophers also uh, appear to believe they do. All right, so that's, that's uh, the first pass at these um, uh, data. Uh, to summarize uh, the results, we have a partial replication, but not a complete replication of Turid as work in the USA, somewhat similar to data with the find, but far from being as clear. But the decreasing proportion of knowledge description across types of cases, namely across versions of luck that, that was reported in literature, just doesn't happen to be observed at any of our, of our, of our sites. Um, as Thomas and Friedman had reported as the confirmation of their, of their uh, results, uh, there's some form of getting cases that are totally fine for, for lay people. They view them exactly as instances of, of knowledge, so that authentic evidence uh, get, uh, get your cases. Uh, and so it used to be surprisingly robust across cultures. And I think one of the interesting results that we actually didn't hypothesize, you know, it was more meant as a control question, really, than as a, um, as a target question, is that the truth effect for how reasonable it is to form a belief actually is extremely, is extremely culture, sens uh, culture sensitive and very dramatically across, across culture. I think in some cultures, people focus on what's in your head to decide whether it was reasonable to form a belief. In other cultures, people focus on what's in the world to decide whether it was reasonable for you to form, to form a belief. And I think that's a really interesting and surprising um, uh, results of, of, that, uh, of that project. All right, I think that's it. I'll, uh, oh, I, I want to uh, first thank all the GPP members. Thanks also to the John Templeton Foundation for the study, and thank you for your attention.